Hello and welcome to the first episode of Unipass Market Insights in 2025. We hope that you had a good start and obviously I'm very happy and delighted that this year again our chief analyst Gregor Pett is on my side to answer my questions. Otherwise it would be a rather short format. Uh, so thanks for being with us again this year. Hi Gregor. Hi Florian. Good to be here. Again. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you and I hope you had a good start as well. Yeah, it was relatively quiet in comparison to the previous years. Okay, good deal. Yeah, and you've got a cool sweater here, so I like it. It's certainly very warm. Yeah. So Thank you very much. Yeah, it's rather cold still in Germany uh, and I'm a huge Yankee fan, so mm -hmm. it was a good, good uh, match. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Before we come to our insights, I just want to uh, highlight that our CEO, uh, Mike Lewis, also had a good start of the year. Um, he was awarded with the honor of Commander of the Order of the British Empire. That is done usually by King Charles III directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so congratulations, Mike, to receive that award. Mm -hmm. If you out there would like to know more about it, uh, just go to unipod.energy to the press release section and find out who else was on the list. Some quite interesting people there. Mm -hmm. But before we start into 2025, I would like to look back uh, on 2024 because the German GRID network came out with uh, some numbers, which I would like to run by you. In Germany, we had a total a production of 432 terawatt hours, uh, which is a decline of 4%. Just to put some, some comparison to it, in Sweden, we had 162 UK 280 and the US 4,112. There we saw an increase of production of 2%, in Germany a decrease of 4%. What were the reasons in Germany for the decrease? Yeah, electricity con consumption is typically impacted by what uh, every one of us does, consuming electricity. And we saw some savings, so people with the high prices were, were saving electricity. But the main factor here is industrial production. and. Uh, therefore a reduction in, in offtake and th this is of course not good news because you want an, an industry that is uh, prospering mm -hmm. and uh, low consumption in this case is not a good sign. Yeah? Okay. If, uh, other than that en energy conservation is, is of course then a good thing other than that. Yeah. So we hope that this will change this year. On a positive note though, um, renewables increased mm -hmm. the share of it to 60%. What is the ranking of the renewable power in Germany? The most important is wind and then solar and biomass then mm -hmm. in, in that order. Uh, that shows the, the results of years long of outbuild of renewable energy sources. So this is actually a good sign that we see an increase good. In, in that production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we talked about it as well that we need to increase renewables definitely for the energy transition. And to put it into perspective as well, UK, 37% of renewable share within the mix. And Sweden, a total of 96% percent there we have low carbon production so mm. um, nuclear is in there as well so not mm. only renewables but nuclear but 96 percent that's quite a significant number there yeah sweden like all the nordic countries has a big advantage they have a lot of hydro production mm. which is carbon free so they can cover almost all of their demand uh, by uh, those uh, those sources uh, so they uh, clearly have a big advantage when it comes to energy yeah. production Absolutely. Looking at coal and gas, we had a decline of 9%, so a total production of 177 terawatt hours. Within that mix, we saw coal decreasing and gas increasing. Uh, what sticks out to you? When it comes to these yeah, numbers? coal, I mean, th this is of course <clears throat> um, a result of the regulatory driven phase out of coal. So we also mm -hmm. have in 2024 seen coal plants going offline and also producing less and less. So if you have uh, renewable energy sources, they produce at a marginal cost of zero, which means when you have it there, it produces basically at, at, at no additional cost. Whereas if you run a fossil plant, you have to pay for the coal or the gas yeah. that you use. So it's clearly more expensive then it's still needed in many hours still, mm -hmm. uh, but it's more expensive, uh, which means then the more renewables you've got, the more, uh, the less you have uh, uh, gas and, uh, and, and coal producing. So mm -hmm. it's a natural result of that build, build out and the change in the generation mix. You know, I think it's, mm -hmm also very important to highlight here that of course increase of renewables and then decrease of the fossil fuels mm -hmm. also leads to reduction of co2 emissions and that was around three percent last year so 
the uh, CO2 reduction in the energy production sector is actually well underway. Um, it's not the same in, in transport and in the housing sector, mm -hmm. so where it's more difficult and we are not well uh, underway or reaching the targets. But mm -hmm. uh, energy production is, uh, is moving in the right direction. Definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned Sweden, we also receive a lot of electricity from our neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. um, France, for example, Sweden. What is the reason behind that? Yeah, so the, the market is connected mm -hmm. yeah, and so you can basically buy electricity from Sweden and from France and the markets are even coupled. If we have demand in Germany that can't be met by the power plants here or can be cheaper production from France, this mm -hmm. will happen in the connected market. So this means that in the cases where we have, for example, a low of renewable production due to uh, weather conditions in Germany, French sources can provide that or Nordic hydro sources and in France this means in many cases then that nuclear production mm -hmm. then would come in and cover the demand in Germany. So it's, uh, it's an optimization and it's quite efficient to have that on a European scale. It goes both ways though, right? It goes both ways. Okay. Yeah. So, and actually 24 was the first year where we uh, actually imported more than we exported. Okay. Yeah. Quite interesting numbers and one thing that sticked out to me as well since we discussed negative prices uh, in the November episode, a total of 457 hours in the last year were uh, attached to negative prices. Mm. So quite interesting. Um, if you want to know more about negative prices, uh, as I mentioned, go to the November edition of Market Insights where we covered that. We saw the other side of the medallion though. Uh, high prices uh, mm. were also um, shown over the last couple of weeks. In the press, uh, at least the German press, we often heard the words Dunkelflaute. Uh, I think you can um, kind of translate it with the, like darkness, uh, slump or slack. What is the reason for that? When there's no, no wind and uh, no solar uh, and no, no sun, mm -hmm. so which means then a low in photovoltaic production and energy from wind turbines. Well, the German term, that's probably one of these, uh, these words where a German word then makes it also uh, <laughs> into the English language. Uh, there are some examples of that. And I mean, it relates dunkel, that's dark, obviously, and flauta mm. relates, uh, it's a, a maritime expression uh, to a situation where there's no wind. Mm. And it was very important uh, in the time of sailing ships, obviously, when they mm -hmm. couldn't sail uh, for lack of wind. So this is where it comes from. And it's very clear if you, on average, share more than a half uh, from renewable production, there uh, certainly there are more days in a row where there's uh, virtually uh, no or very low production mm. from that and then you need other sources to cover your energy demand because the demand as we all know is not really really depending on, uh, on solar and wind. Uh, no, we need other sources or imports from our neighbors uh, then to cover yeah. demand in that situation. How important is LNG in our storage capacity then? It's extremely important because if you want in these situations want to run gas plants you need to have the gas to run them. Coal plant would have a heap of coal in, mm. in front of the, the, the plant. A gas plant needs a gas from the grid and that comes then uh, very often in winter out of storage. You need the gas there, but mm. you also need the uh, capacity, uh, the possibility to extract it within a very short period of time. So mm. you will need to cover that high demand that then suddenly comes up. In Germany, we have uh, storage sites that uh, can do both. Yeah, mm. So that's we are in the fortunate situation that we can cover that. Uh, I always compare it to the barbecues at home. Uh, if you need to heat up something really, really quick, um, use the gas one. Um, cold definitely takes a little bit longer. Taste is better, but uh, if you want the flexible power, I mm -hmm. think the gas uh, for mm -hmm. the power plants uh, is, is needed in that case. And yeah. your storage tank then below Absolutely. that is LPG and not uh, natural Exactly, gas exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, when we look at this situation, um, storage, I think, um, is below 70 percent uh, in, in Europe at, at this moment, point. Yes, yeah. I looked up Germany yesterday, it was mm -hmm. around 65 percent at the time of mm -hmm. the recording. Obviously, we have the targets um, of at least 50 percent in storage. Mm -hmm. I think Europe, um, almost every country will reach that except, I think, the Netherlands. When I look at the LNG numbers, though, I see that we import around 80 percent from the U.S. Mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. what we discussed over the last years, always the dependencies of Russian gas we had previously. Are we moving into another dependency here? Well, de dependency, yes, but comparing apples with peers in this situation, mm -hmm. because case of the Russian gas, uh, that was a pipeline connection, and there were also long-term contracts behind that with takeoff obligations then. Mm -hmm. 
LNG is in principle flexible. Uh, clearly the US is a leading supplier as we speak, but in principle we can buy cargoes of LNG all around the world and bring them to Europe. Mm -hmm. So there's much more flexibility involved uh, in that. Of course, we need to monitor, does it change? How does it change? But at, the, at this point in time, there's a, a great difference between these two. Okay. Uh, if you want, want to call it dependencies. Understood. And I think it's you know uh, our uh, mission as well mm -hmm. to uh, to take a look at what happens in the in the U.S. Uh, Trump lifted the Biden energy project ban uh, on day one with an executive order. So we have to wait to see mm -hmm. what the outcome there is. Yeah, and, and that was expected, by the way, and it doesn't affect so much immediate production, but rather projects that are further out. I would say a, s a signal in which direction this is going, and mm -hmm. that was expected, uh, that hydrocarbon production would be very much favored by the uh, new administration. Yeah. Uh, no surprise there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, stay on the global stage. Um, of course, we have good news with the ceasefire in the Middle East. Um, of course, we have to see how that develops. I mean, there's still risk attached to that. If we take a look at Ukraine, there were some news about the stop of the transit flows of the Russian gas through the Ukraine. Can you explain us what that was all about? Yeah, also that was no surprise. There were still uh, some volumes coming through Ukraine to southwestern Europe uh, until it stopped an uh, order of magnitude of 40 million cubic meters a day. So that was uh, the highest flow in 2024. And that has gone to zero now as of uh, 1st of Jan. And the reason is that the transit contract between the Russians and uh, the Ukraine grid operator expired and heard some rumors in 24, would there a new solution be found and would that continue? That didn't materialize, mm. and as a result of that, uh, we don't see any transit volumes through that route. Who is affected by that? That's mainly Austria, Slovakia, and Hungary. Mm. Slovakia is most affected. You can also see the nervousness uh, then from Slovakia when it comes to uh, yeah. uh, supplies, gas supplies. I mean, I think we're talking about around 5% of European imports mm -hmm. came through that pipeline. In regards to security of supply, how do you see the situation there for, for this year? People could prepare for that, and uh, Austria has made it clear also they had prepared for, uh, for that situation. So I don't see a big risk right now mm -hmm. uh, for that. Of course, then these volumes need to be replaced by other sources, and LNG is part of that okay. solution. Also, these countries can uh, get energy through LNG terminals from the north, also from German LNG terminals or other European LNG terminals, and that can clearly also be part of the solution here. Okay. Something we will report on Absolutely. in this format as well. Let's go to our questions from the audience, uh, one of my favorite mm -hmm. parts of the show. Apostolos wants to know, hello you two, uh, thank you very much for your insights. I would like to know the difference between megawatt and megawatt hours. Can you please let me know? Thank you. Yeah, sure. A megawatt hour and kilowatt hour is an amount of energy. So mm -hmm. this is uh, energy you can use then to heat your your room, you produce some light, that's the energy you need for that. Megawatt is the amount of energy produced within a period of time. So mm -hmm. if you've got a megawatt hour, you produce that within an hour, you have one megawatt. Yeah? So if you've produced one megawatt hour in that hour, mm -hmm. and we use that to, for example, describe how much a power plant can produce within a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. yeah? So that's the difference. Power plant has a capacity of 400 megawatts which means then th within an hour, this plant can produce the energy of uh, 400 megawatt hours. Mm -hmm. Understood. And maybe to put a, a number in an, as an example uh, to that, the average three-person household in Germany needs around 3,000 to 4,000 kilowatt hours a year. So Yeah, but that is probably if you don't have an electrical vehicle that you are charging That's as true. Well from that. Uh, so, so above at the, at the pet's place. Yeah, yeah, so we have an EV, so that's, uh, we have more than that. Okay. Yeah. All right, so Apostolos, I hope we could answer your question. Um, let's come to the next one. Caitlin wants to know, what do we have to look at in 2025 in regards to the developments on the energy markets? Lots of stuff. US, we mentioned that already. Mm -hmm. We need to see what kind of uh, changes the new administration uh, makes to energy markets and uh, mm -hmm. monitor that closely. Closer to home here, and, uh, we have also German elections coming up, so uh, some very important topics for the energy industry mm -hmm. are on the agenda. Uh, for example, to build gas-fired or hydrogen-fired plants, mm -hmm. uh, to secure the energy in cases where we have no wind and no sun. Uh, that's what we dis discussed yeah. earlier, so we need 
new plans being built for that and how the government we have after the elections will approach that, uh, we have to see. I mean, the weather is also obviously also very important. Yeah. We saw how much that can impact uh, the energy industry. Right now, it seems to be that, that we have a later winter of like milder temperatures. I think that's, that's, that's safe the case to say. at the moment. So, um, but of course, mm -hmm. it depends, uh, can change as well. Um, I think I uh, mean, China, China production, China? obviously. So yeah. China is, of course, very big, and uh, what happens economically in China has an impact on the world energy markets as well. So, for yeah. example, LNG, if they don't need it, they will sell it back to the market. If they need it, they will probably buy more. This has a huge impact on the global gas markets. Right? Okay. Good thing that we have a format where we can discuss all of that developments. Let's take a look. We have a couple of um, big conventions in 2025 as well. One of the bigger ones is just around the corner, the E-Worlds mm -hmm. in, yes. in Essen. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the beginning of uh, February. And if you out there would like to see us in person, we will do a recording of Market Insights from our Unipa stand on the 12th of February from quarter to four to around 4.30. So just stop by and maybe prepare a nice question for yeah, Mr. Pitt. Yeah, that would be great. Good deal. Um, I will also post the landing page to the event in that format. So just take a look. And Gregor, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the rest of the year, uh, giving insights with you together to our audience. And thank you very much already for episode number one. Yeah, thank you and uh, see you on e -world. And to you out there, thank you very much for watching. Hope you tune in next time again. Until then, bye-bye.